Okay, welcome to this evening's Dharma Talk. And it's a special one this evening because this evening I'm going to be talking about a very special subject in the uh, part of meditation called the jhanas. And it's a very special subject because these are very powerful states of mind. They are parts of the path of meditation and they were so exalted by the Buddha and so praised and encouraged that he called the jhanas the eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. When we study the Buddha's teachings we find that the jhanas are so important he said such things as like the jhanas are the path without jhanas there's no path. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye bye. <laughs> Okay, I'll try and get a bit closer. There's all sorts of other stuff on here, so I can't take the thing off. Is that better? Okay, good. Okay, so I'll start again. This evening I'm going to be talking about the jhanas. These are the deep states of medita- meditation, which are natural to a meditator. They happen, whether one likes it or not. They're just stages of letting go. It's just what happens when one follows this path of meditation. And they are also exalted by the Buddha. They're just so important that if anyone studies the Buddha's teachings, it doesn't matter whether it's in Theravada, Mahayana, Zen, Tibetan, or whatever, you'd always come across the Eightfold Path and the final factor, the culminating factor of the Eightfold Path is called Samma Samadhi. Well, some people call it right concentration. I don't like that uh, explanation or that translation at all. <coughs> Simply because concentration gives too much idea of force, concentrating, of like a, an exertion of willpower. Whereas the jhanas, as I'll explain later on, are completely different than any sort of strong willpower. In fact, there are states where the willpower has completely disappeared. Which is much, I prefer the more accurate translation, is like stages of letting go, of complete letting go, of right letting go. So in the same way in English, we have the Eightfold Path starting off as right view, right thought, right speech, actual livelihood right effort, right, mind, right um, mindfulness. And the last factor I call right letting go. And this is the jhanas. And those jhanas are so powerful that it was the reason why the Buddha became enlightened. The story of the Buddha's enlightenment, many of you will know, will recognize from the time you were in Dharma school or because you've been reading books, After leaving his home for six years, the Buddha-to-be tried to practice austerities. He'd never got anywhere with asceticism. And (coughs) he gave up all of that and he remembered the only time in his life so far he'd attained a state of deep meditation as a young boy under the rose apple tree while watching his father perform a ceremony Spontaneously he attained the first jhana state and that was obviously because of his previous lives and he hadn't practiced that for all that time and just before his enlightenment he recalled that experience and according to the sutra which is very powerful, so powerful I remember it by heart it's the Mahasachika Sutta, number 36 in the Majjhima Nikaya. He said, Why am I afraid of that happiness, of that bliss, which has nothing to do with unwholesome states? Referring to that experience of the first jhana. And the insight came to him, I will not be afraid of that happiness and bliss, which has nothing to do with the Uh, unwholesome states and understanding that in order to get into those jhanas that you had to have a reasonably healthy body comfort of the body he gave up his austerities took a good meal, had a bath rested and then gathered some grass and sat under the Bodhi tree and under the Bodhi tree 
He practiced those jhanas again, got into the deep meditations, and from there developed the insights which made him a Buddha. And after he became a Buddha, he then taught this <coughs> middle way an eightfold path. And the eightfold path culminating in these jhana states. And I mentioned that about fear because already some of you yogis on this retreat, when you start getting into deep meditation, you too get a bit afraid. Because one of the main reasons why you get afraid in this deep meditation is because you are losing control. And you're meant to lose control. <laughs> you're meant to let go. And especially you're meant to allow that part of the mind called the doer to completely disappear. One of the reasons you're getting afraid is because you're losing your ego, your sense of self. This little thing inside of you which you've been so attached to that once it disappears then you may understand what the Buddha meant by non-self. You've got to allow it to disappear first before you can realize there's nothing there. But, in the meantime, we're having to let go of many, many things. And when you let go in these deep meditations, you get to such strange and weird states of mind, because you've never been to these states of mind before. Sometimes it's very rare for a person even to be in a state of mind where they're not thinking, where they're completely silent. To the point that sometimes that is strange enough and people feel a bit afraid. They're not thinking, ah, what's happening? But many of you know that even in that stage where the thinking absolutely stops, you don't have to hold the mind still, it's just perfectly alert, but without a commentary, that piece is very wonderful, very beautiful, very relaxing. Later on you get to the stage where the body has disappeared, you can't feel the hands, the feet, the legs, the head, anything. Sometimes again people feel afraid, ah, what's going on? But you know from experience it's just wonderful to be free of this body. So you've got no aches, no pains. You don't have to worry about scratching anything. The mosquitoes or flies can land on you. You can't feel it. There's no heat and there's no cold. You're completely free of the feeling of the body. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. When it first happens though, you get afraid. Why are we getting afraid? Because we are losing something we think is important. We really think that if we're not always aware of our body, something's going to go wrong. We're breaking off attachments. And when those attachments are let go of, things disappear, and we start to feel more and more free. In particular, as I said last night, that when you let go of these five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, with the disappearance of those five senses, comes a disappearance of the body. With the disappearance of the body comes a disappearance of the five senses. Because <coughs> these two are intimately joined up together. When you can't hear, you can't feel, you can't see, smell, taste, it's all gone, this body. The awareness of the body has disappeared. You don't know what's going on. It's fascinating to understand that sometimes people think that these five senses are here to protect the body. But actually it's the opposite is true. The body is here to give a field for the five senses to play around in the world. The body is actually serving the senses, not the other way around. And when you let go of the body, when you let go of the five senses, all that's disappeared and you feel an immense sense of freedom. The joy, the happiness which comes with the appearance of the nimittas, what I was saying yesterday, is all because the five senses have completely vanished and the body is gone. The suffering which is there with the body, the suffering which is there with the senses, has now disappeared. And I'll go on about that later on when we understand what suffering is. But just actually to mention it to you, the most beautiful sight, the most pleasant feeling, the most wonderful sound, is so awful compared to the silence where there's no sound, the emptiness and no feeling. When everything disappears, that's the happiest of all. And you experience that. <coughs> so what happens when you've been meditating so far and you get to the stage of this nimitta when the body's completely disappeared 
when you can't hear anything, when you can't even feel your body, at that particular stage, you'll find a lot of peace, a lot of happiness, and in fact quite a lot of joy. When that nimitta arises, it's very brilliant and bright and beautiful and happy. And this is an important thing to understand, that that happiness, that peace, that bliss, is because a big burden, a big heavy weight has been taken off you. Imagine that you were born with a big backpack on your back and you've had lots of rocks and stones and weights and uh, bars of iron in that backpack and you've been carrying it around ever since you could remember. And once you come on this retreat and you take off that backpack for the first time in your life and you feel, ah, oh, the weight has gone, I feel so free, so light. Now you can understand what that simile means. In that backpack, you've got your body, you've got your seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and physical touch. And that's been with you ever since you were born. And now you've been able to take that off and put it down. And you're free from these things. That freedom is incredible happiness. <coughs> Which is why that sometimes when these nimitas get very strong, they come with enormous bliss and happiness and joy. And sometimes you think you can't stand it, it's just so strong. Sometimes it appears to people when a nimitta is just so brilliant and bright, it's like you're going blind. But also it just gives you enormous energies, rushes of bliss and ecstasy. This is the nature because something has disappeared which was a big weight and a burden. Your five senses and your body. And this is actually what happened to the Buddha. Everyone goes through the same stage of letting go, abandoning things. But there's still one more thing left which stops you from going into the jhanas. The thing which is left, which stops you going into the jhanas once you get to the nimitta stage, is the last bit of doing, of will, of choice, of control. Now I've already mentioned from the very beginning of this meditation retreat, it's all about letting go, leaving things alone, abandoning things, putting things away, putting things down. Which is why the jhanas are stages of letting go. Letting go of what? Many years ago, I started to <coughs> wonder about being a monk was so difficult. Because first of all, you know, when he became a monk, he had to let go of sex, of girls and girlfriends. That was hard enough when you'd be a young man. But then you found out you were getting really into the food. If ever you notice, any of you have done a novice program, when you give up sort of the opposite gender, you get very interested in the food. The food is very important and young monks tend to eat a lot. And I said, hang on, I'm trying to let go of my cravings. And instead of actually, I remember once as a young monk, I dreamt of being in this house made of chocolate éclair. <coughs> All the tables were covered with chocolate with cream underneath. They were made of the chocolate éclair bread. The whole house was chocolate éclair. Because I liked chocolate éclairs, so that was my dream. And of course, as soon as I managed to, to buy into one of these chocolate éclairs, and this whole house made of chocolate éclair, I woke up. You know what it's like, because you almost get what you want in a dream, and as soon as you get it, you wake up. You never get it. It's suffering. But the point was, that's just how much craving I had for food when I was a young monk. So I thought, look, I'm supposed to be giving up craving. So you gave up the craving for food, and then you had the craving for sleep, or you had the craving for cups of tea or sweets or something. And it was so difficult. <coughs> you gave up one thing, and then you picked up something else. And you put that down and before you know it you grasp onto something else. It's so hard to understand what are you supposed to let go of. Until when you learn about meditation, what you let go of, to get to the heart of it, you let go of the doer, the thing which starts doing the picking up to begin with. You let go of the choice, the will, that which moves the mind. You let that go. That's why from the very beginning of this meditation retreat, I said, make peace with whatever you're doing. Allow it to be. Be a passenger on the journey. Don't rush to the front of the plane or 
think you're being lazy sitting in the back of the plane. You're just a passenger. This plane, this eightfold path is taking you to Nibbana whether you like it or not. So let go. This is an important part of meditation. And when you let go that much, you let go of the will, the driver, the chooser. You let go of the thing which keeps manipulating and changing things. Then you find, not only does the nimitta stay, but it can go that one step further and go into the jhanas. When we look at what we mean by the jhanas, states of stillness, it should be very obvious to you that what's the enemy of stillness? The enemy of stillness is doing something. If you do something, you actually disturb the stability and the tranquility. All movement of the mind disturbs it. And this little will, this choosing, this doing is what disturbs the tranquility of your mind. However, it takes a lot of courage and guts to give up control. It is that which we really attach to, controlling and being in charge. Here you're letting go of what's really important. Letting go of the one in charge, the controller, the doer, the manipulator, the control freak. And that takes a lot of courage and faith because it gets scary at this point. You're letting go. However, there is a big payoff, a reward. It's a carrot. And that carrot is the incredible bliss of when you stop doing things you let go and you completely abandon yourself. It's as if in that nimitta it gets brighter and brighter, more and more beautiful. And it's as if that in the middle of that nimitta is like a doorway. A moment it's only a metaphor. A little doorway into this incredible bliss and freedom. And you're scared to go in that doorway simply because you have to leave so much outside. You have to leave basically what you take yourself to be your identity, your ego, your controller. But it's so beautiful inside, so enticing. The time will come <coughs> when you can't resist it. You just allow yourself to go inside. And inside, there's incredible bliss and peace. But inside, the one thing which you notice is that the will, the ability to do things, has been stripped away from you. You can't move. You can't do things. Now that's an important sign of the jhanas. The states of no will. It's because there's no ability to choose, to will, to manipulate, to do. That's one of the reasons why these states are so still. Because there's nothing to move them. So after the nimitta stage, if you keep doing this letting go practice, and you have enough guts, enough faith, or you are just drawn by the power of the bliss, will enter these incredible weird stages, uh, <coughs> weird um, states of mind called the jhanas. For those of you who know the description, they started off as we we chewa kamehi, we we cha kusalehi dhammehi. This is the party, just to show that I know this. It's not just speaking from experience, it's also from the text as well. It means we we che we we he means completely separated from the five senses. Karma, not the K A double M A, not the law of karma. This is like the five sense world. Karma. This is the Buddha's description. These states of jhana are completely away from the five senses. And you're away from all the unwholesome um, states of mind, in particular the ability to do something. You're stuck, you're still, you're frozen. That's why you're so much at peace. Something has disappeared. <coughs> when you get to such stages, you can tell it must be a jhana state because you can't hear anything, you can't feel the body, nor can you smell, taste or, or uh, see anything. All those five senses are subdued to the point that they're just not there for you. Which means if someone comes and tells you, hey, come out, it's lunchtime. 
It's not that you ignore them, it's just you can't hear them. If someone comes along <coughs> and pokes you, you would not feel it. You're just beyond the physical body. You're completely safe. For those of you who get a bit scared, ah, if I'm not there to look after me, what might happen? And I told the story the other night about that guy who went to hospital because his, mother, his wife thought he was dead. He got into one of these jhana states because he truly let go. <coughs> his wife came into the bedroom because he'd been meditating longer than usual, couldn't see his stomach going up and down, called the ambulance, the ambulance came along, put him in the back, or they took his pulse first of all, could find no pulse, took him to the hospital, into the emergency room, put on the ECG which was flat, no heart activity, then the EEG, his brain was dead, no brain activity at all, no top class equipment, the equipment wasn't wrong, he was just meditating, so still, not even his brain was moving. And he was there for a few hours and he came out afterwards. But the reason I told the story again was because I also asked him, didn't you hear that ambulance siren? Siren, Because those sirens are really loud. Didn't you feel those medics put you into the, um, <coughs> the ambulance? And even more so, while he was actually in the emergency room, because his heart wasn't going, they put on the defibrillators. These pads for which they put this electric shock which actually lift you a couple of centimetres off the, the, uh, the stretcher. Surely he felt that. No. Didn't feel anything on the body. All he felt was just bliss. Fully alert, fully mindful, deeply inside. Couldn't even feel defibrillators on him. Now this is actually a classic case of what happens in the jhanas. The five senses are completely shut down. So you can't hear anything, you can't feel anything. But for those of you who think, wow, he was lucky, what would have happened if they'd have taken him down the, to the morgue? <laughs> and I say what would happen, he would have probably scared the hell out of those people walking in the, in the morgue when he came out of his meditation. <laughs> but he is perfectly safe. Because it's an old story from the time of the Buddha. When this, one of these monks was in this deep jhana, <coughs> in the forest meditating, and these two lay people came, they were foresters. And they were you know, Buddhists, they were disciples of the Buddha. And so they saw this monk sitting there in the forest. And they too couldn't see any breath coming in and out of his body. So they too thought he was dead. And they thought, well, you know, we're Buddhists. And we can't let the monk just sit like, there like that. Because, you know, there's animals in the jungle, they'll just go and eat him. And that's not the proper way to dispose of the body of such a holy monk like this. So they decided to uh, put her off their work for an hour or two. They got some timber from the forest, they built a nice pyre, they put the monk on the top of the pyre, they did a little bit of charting, whatever they knew, and then they lit the fire. And when the fire was really, really strong, they thought, oh no, we've done enough now, the fire will sort of burn the monk's body and cremate him properly. We've done our bit for this, the Buddhism, we've been devoted lay people, so now we can go off to work. So they left him, burning away merrily, and then they went off to do their work. But of course he wasn't dead, he was just one of the jhanas. And so the next morning, imagine the shock they got when he came into the village on arms round. Just no, not burnt at all, not even his robes were burnt. And that's one of the things which happens when you go to the estates. You're protected. Even there's another monk. <coughs> um, this is a, a modern story. He was an Indonesian monk. And he became, he had a very great samadhi. And he went, he was in the jungle one day, in somewhere in Java, meditating and got into one of these deep meditations. He doesn't know for how many days. Because when you get in these meditations, they're very powerful and you're very still. And... <coughs> When he came out of meditation afterwards, he noticed there was just like marks on the trees above his head. He checked afterwards and sure enough there had been a flood. In very heavy rainstorms, he was in a bit of a, a valley, the river had overflowed, it was a flood for a few days. Way above his head. He hadn't known a thing about being completely submersed. This is what happens in meditation. This is what you can do. So you're completely safe. That's the first thing. Nothing can harm you. 
So number one, you go into very deep states of mind. Number two, you can't hear anything. One of the classic stories from our tradition, <coughs> and this is actually just shows you just how easy it is to get into one of these states. Many of you have read books from my teacher Ajahn Chah, and some of you like those books very much. They've got some very nice uh, dharma, very uh, good teachings, very easy to understand, nice and pithy and to the point. However, that's not what Ajahn Chah was like in reality. In reality, when he'd give a sermon, it would go for three or four hours, if you were lucky, sometimes longer than that. Most of it was just so boring. But every now and again he'd say something really profound. And so what you see in those books is all those profound statements just taken out of context, just the profound stuff, the interesting stuff, and all the boring stuff has been filtered away. So you just get the cream. Whereas when you were actually with him, <laughs> you had to just endure before you got those few pearls of wisdom. But it was worth it. So sometimes you'd be just so bored when he was giving his talks. Now this was actually usual Ajahn Chah. <coughs> so this one evening, he was giving one of these long talks and going on and on and on. It wasn't one of his best. And there was a little novice there. You know these little novice monks who ordain as monks simply because that sometimes they've got no family to look after them? or there's been some sort of social problem, so at least they have an education and the well looked after. So as a little novice there, he was in the monastery, but he didn't really want to be in the monastery, he just had to be. So there one evening he was listening to one of these really boring talks by Ajahn Chah going on and on and on. And after about an hour of this, he started getting irritated. And he started thinking, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And that became just an obsession with him, always thinking, how many more minutes, when is he going to stop? Doesn't he know it's three hours already? I'm just a little, little novice, I need my sleep. When's he going to stop, when's he going to stop? <coughs> and then after a couple of hours, this little novice had an insight. An insight means you see something in this a slightly different way and it has a huge difference in meaning. His little insight was instead of saying, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? He thought, when am I going to stop? And with that thought, you know, the little novice thinking, when am I going to stop? The little novice stopped. When he opened his eyes again, it was about two or three o'clock in the morning, all the monks had long gone, he just had his first deep meditation. Just one happy little novice. As soon as he said stop, Stopping doing things, stopping moving, stopping controlling, stopping... His whole mind had stopped. And he got into one of these deep jhanas, this very lot of bliss, so deep inside of himself, he couldn't hear the end of the discourse. He couldn't hear Ajahn Chah, so ringing the bell, saying, you can all go back to sleep now. He'd just been sitting there, oblivious to all the monks leaving, and he was just so happy, so peaceful. These are examples of what the jhanas are like. You can't hear anything. But all you need to do is to let go or stop. <coughs> stop doing things. So when you actually get to this nimitta stage, like I said last night, if you can remember Ajahn Chah's simile of the still forest fall, when these things come out, don't move. Don't do anything. Don't try and get further. If you try and get into a jhana, you'll never get there. Some monks who get their first jhana spend years and years trying to get back there again because they forget how they entered. They entered by giving up, not doing anything, by letting go, by stopping. And you get this stupid idea that you have to work to get there again. And because of that craving, it creates the doing and that stops you re-experiencing those things. So now you know that the way to get there is be content. Stop doing things, this is good enough. Be still, be peaceful, be patient. Going back to that simile of the thousand petal lotus, when you get to those beautiful limiter states, those beautiful petals, like bright lights in the mind, you don't do anything. 
you make your, your mindfulness even more still. And only if it doesn't move at all, for the nimmer to open up. And this is actually how you experience it. You're just watching this nimmer turn this beautiful bright light. As long as you learn how to not interfere, to leave it alone, to let go, to make peace, say, <coughs> this is good enough, so the mind doesn't move at all. Then it gets brighter and brighter, and you feel yourself being drawn right into the middle of that nimitta. Or the alternative is that nimitta just comes and envelops you. You go in to the center. That's classic meditation technique always going in to whatever you're experiencing now. You never go on to the next stage. The next stage is always inside the one you're experiencing now. I don't know if you've ever seen those Russian dolls. These little dolls made out of wood. You open them up, there's another little doll inside. You open up that one, there's another little doll inside that one. You open that one up, and there's another little doll inside of that one. On my last retreat, somebody gave me a set of those Russian dolls because they wanted me to use it for visual aids when I talked about jhanas. <laughs> I should have brought it along, but I didn't, sorry. But this is exactly what happens. In the side, the middle of the nimitta, you open that up and inside is a jhana. So all you need to do is keep focusing and stop doing things. And you find yourself just going in. While you're inside these jhanas, Sometimes uh, you wonder exactly what's going on. You don't really care because you can't move anyway. You, you, you just blissed out. After a while, you emerge from the jhana. It's only after you emerge can you have any idea of what was going on. You cannot assess the jhana while you're inside. To be able to assess anything, to get to know it, the mind has to be able to move, to think. At these stages the mind is just too frozen solid, too still to be able to really know what's going on. That's why it is true, insight does not occur within a jhana. The mind is far too still to be able to get an insight within the jhana. But as I was mentioned yesterday, the jhanas give you the data and you work on that data afterwards and that's where you get the powerful insights from. But within the jhana you can't think. If you can think, it's not jhana. If ever the thought comes up, is this jhana, you can know for sure it can't be. <laughs> Even if you can ask that question, you're too, the mind isn't subtle enough, it's not still enough. So inside the jhana you're actually frozen solid. And it's only afterwards you come out and then you look, what was that? And it's almost like you can go through a checklist to find out whether it was a jhana or not. You ask, could I hear anything? Could I feel my body? Could I think? And if the answer to any of those questions is yes, it can't be a jhana in some other state. In a jhana you can't feel your body. You can't hear any sounds. And you can't sort of... Um, think at all. Any verbal functions of the mind are completely gone. And which is sometimes people say, well doesn't it say in the suttas that the first jhana is something called vitaka vichara? And it has got vitaka vichara, but that does not mean thinking. And it's interesting, I've been saying that for such a long time. And one of my friends, he's been comparing as actually many of you know, that Ajahn Sujato, who used to live here over in Ippo for one year, he's been spending a lot of time just comparing the, uh, the Chinese Agama and the Pali Tripitaka because we share many different texts. Many of the uh, teachings of the Pali Canon and the Theravada are there in the Chinese as well. And he was actually comparing some of them. I know that sometimes in the Chinese Tripitaka you got more early teachings than in the Theravada. It's fascinating to see that. And sometimes much better translations. So actually comparing the two we get much deeper understanding of what original Buddhism was. <coughs> but anyhow, when it came to Vitaka Vichara, he found that when it comes to jhana, they use different Chinese characters for Vitaka Vichara than if they do when it's ordinary thinking. Even the whoever translated those, that Chinese knew 
that these two words, these Pali words, have a different meaning for jhana and for outside of jhana. Because outside of jhana, yeah, it does mean a movement of the mind which becomes thought. Within the jhana, it's a pre-verbal movement of the mind. Because what happens in a first jhana, this is first stage once you go through the nimitta, the object of your mind is bliss. If you ask yourself afterwards, what was I aware of? People always say bliss. But you'll find the important feature of the first jhana is that bliss is not stable. It's got what I've called a wobble. What's actually happens there is you have the bliss in front of you and because this is the first stage of the jhanas the mind is not absolutely still yet. It holds on to the bliss. It grasps it. And because it grasps onto the bliss that makes it unstable. And then the attention just moves away slightly from the bliss. Because <coughs> the bliss is so strong, it pulls you straight back there. You, know, you can't go too far away. You can't go back into the world of the body. And because it pulls you back again, that um, pulling the mind back onto the bliss, that's called the vitaka. The grasping, the holding onto it is called the vichara. That's actually what those two words mean in that context. The mind moving to its object, holding its object. Those are the things which are the imperfections of that first jhana state. It's only known by a little bit of a wobble in your bliss. And only then, after many, many times of going into that first jhana, can you recognize those states. Because these are very fine states of mind, you have to go back to them many, many times to really understand what's going on. While in there, all you're doing is collecting data. You can't work anything out. Your mind can't think. When you come out afterwards, you will always say, my goodness, what was that? That was the most powerful experience. You go back and you look at it <coughs> using your what's called uh, reflective mind. And you look at what happened there, you may be able to see there was a wobble going on. And that was a sure sign of the first jhana. <coughs> what happens usually is what goes into the first jhana first. <coughs> if you have enough letting go, the mind doesn't actually hold on to it anymore. You can actually let it go. You can just allow the bliss to be without grasping it. In the Pali it's called like internal confidence of mind. In other words, you're willing to let go 100% you go that degree of confidence to fully abandon all of the mind's doing. If you do that, then that bliss is absolutely stable and solid. The second jhana is the refinement of the first jhana. Just like those Russian dolls, it lies right in the middle of the first jhana. The second jhana, the, the most important feature, is that it's like a diamond samadhi. You can't move at all. There's absolute stillness there. When I say absolute stillness, sometimes you think you've known stillness before. But this is the peak of stillness. Because there's no movement at all. Nor is there any movement possible. Even the potential to move has been completely taken away. So there you're there, in this solid, unchanging, unmoving, untrembling bliss completely still, but very aware. Because of its stability, the second jhana usually lasts a long, long time. <coughs> Remember, within these states, you can't, you can't manufacture a thought, it's time to come out. You can't do anything, you're frozen still. Like, an, you're like yourself has been frozen in ice, it can't move. It's like a diamond, like a rock, immovable. That's why that's called the first time of purity of samadhi. Samadhi means the sustained attention, the stillness of the mind, coming about through letting go. Here nothing moves at all. The whole world is stopped, dead in its tracks. 
That's why sometimes when people see you in that state, they think you're dead. Because they can't see anything moving. And inside, there's nothing moving. It's just bliss, unchanging. So there's a neat state of mind to experience. But, you can go deeper. As you go deeper, you find that the bliss which is in the second jhana, has got a rough part to it. But as you let go more and more, in a, in a special case of the second jhana, half of that bliss disappears. <coughs> that is called a pity. Now, many of you may have uh, read the books about these jhanas and know that piti sukha, like sometimes it's called joy and rapture, and all these different monks and nuns trying to <coughs> define what those mean and what the difference is. The point is that because they always go together everywhere except in this third jhana state, you can't really distinguish them. <coughs> the best which I can <coughs> do is to let you know that there's a different type of bliss in the third jhana. Far more blissful than the one you had before. When you do these jhanas, they're all bliss, but they've got different flavors. And sometimes you just get into the first jhana and think, wow, this is the limit, this is the ecstasy, you can't take any more than this. But the ecstasy of a second jhana is even more profound. You think there could be something more than even this second jhana ecstasy. It just blows your mind again. There's an even bigger ecstasy. Which is why that when you start doing this jhana part, you're really starting to know what happiness truly is. And sometimes you think in this world, you may have seen the birth of your son, you may have fallen in love, you may have had the best sex, or you may even have drugs, hopefully never. And you think, wow, that's so happy. You haven't even tasted happiness yet. When you get into these jhanas, that will blow you completely away. The highest, most powerful happiness, bliss you've ever experienced. And that will get you caught on this jhana. And it's meant to. <coughs> the Buddha said, and this is straight from the Buddha's teachings in the Pasadika Sutta, anyone who gets hooked on the jhanas, anyone who gets attached to them, he didn't actually word the attached, he used the word to yoke along with, in the same way that the, they used to have these um, oxen in pairs pulling their carts or their chariots, and they'd always have a pair, and they'd tie them together. This is that word, if you tie yourself to the jhanas regularly, there's only, <coughs> there's only one of four possibilities what happened to you. The four results of being attached, if you like, tied onto the jhanas, are you become a stream winner, a once returner, a non-returner, or fully enlightened. That's all you, what can happen to you. That's the result of being, <laughs> being attached. You get enlightened. So it's a good thing to do. So don't be afraid of that happiness and bliss. The Buddha actually said many times, please make much of it, follow it, develop it, never be afraid of it. So that happiness is allowable. Go for it. And inside of that third jhana, if you think that just this incredible bliss of a third jhana is the limit, still something disappears. What disappears is the feeling of happiness itself. And you get this incredible equanimity, ultimate stillness. And at first you can't realize that equanimity, that stillness, that peace is even more blissful than the, what was happening before. It is the bliss of equanimity when bliss has disappeared. At, the, <coughs> at these points, we start to sound like some uh, Zen mystic speaking in contradictions. But these are such refined states that these are actually what they're like. They're hard to actually to put into words. But there you are, you're experiencing these things. The deeper you go into these jhanas, the longer they last. And some people who say you get into the jhana, even the first jhana, just for a few minutes, you just can't do that. It's still too stable when you get into these jhanas. There is something which I call a ping-pong jhana, because sometimes when you get to enmity, you go into the jhana, but because you're terrified, you know, you're, not, you're going to a strange place, you're not used to it, 
It's almost like an ah, and you come straight out again. You've blown it, stupid. You had a wonderful chance there to stay in this delicious state of mind. You go in for a second, you come straight out again. They call it ping pong jhana. And that's actually quite often that's what happens first of all. The first experience is usually a ping pong one. It's incredible bliss for a few seconds and you're out again. You can't stand it. Later on though, if you had a taste, you'd go back again for sure. It's just too delightful, you can't forget it. And one of these days you just go into this thing. When you go in there, you stay meditating for hours. <coughs> when it comes to lunch or breakfast or whatever, you're just sitting there, you haven't got a clue what's going on outside. You're just so happy inside. You know, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock, and you're still sitting there, haven't moved. You get in there this evening, tomorrow morning, I give the chart and you're still sitting exactly the same place, haven't moved. Happy as anything. The only point is, if you see anybody like that, just be so gentle with them when they come out. Because when you come out of a jhana, wow, that's just the biggest experience of your, of your life. And you, know, you can't just go straight away to lunch. You know, just, wow, this is amazing. It takes a while for you to gently sort of calm down, or not calm down, but actually to get alive again and come back to earth. <coughs> because you've been in a very refined state of mind. And afterwards, your mind will still be very refined, even though it can now perceive what's going on outside, the five senses start to come back again. Still, you're just so sensitive. You've got to give people a time just to actually to come back again. But it's not dangerous at all. These give you incredible, powerful insights. And then, so these are the jhana states. They're powerful. The Buddha actually said, this is where like Mara can't get to you. The reason why Mara can't get to you, because Mara is the controller. The controller in, in chief. Mara is like the devil in Buddhism. He's just like the deluder. He can't have any power if you, just deludes you. <coughs> but he lives in the realm, just below the Brahma realm, this high deva realm, called the Paranimata-wasawati realm, which is a realm of beings who will control over others. That's why in these jhana states, it can't get to you. There's no controlling is possible there. You're away beyond Mara and the sense realm. You're in the realm of the pure mind. Some of you may have gone to temples and seen, they call it Tiloka Arama, the three realms, three realms of existence. All the realm of the, this realm, the heavenly beings, everything you know is called Karma Loka, the realm of the five senses. Above that is called Rupa Loka, that's the realm of the jhanas. And above that is Arupa Loka, of the immaterial attainments. When you get to a jhana, you literally are going into the second realm of existence, the second world. If you go, <coughs> if you go deeper to the immaterial attainments, you might be able to taste another realm of existence, the immaterial realms. Otherwise, you only know just a small portion of just one realm of existence. And you think that from this you can gain all the wisdom to become enlightened. You need more insight, more, more data, more knowledge of what this universe truly is. So what happens when you get into these samsara, into these um, jhanas? Not only does it give you incredible bliss and most fantastic experience of your life. You know, mind gets really powered. It's a great joy and fascinating thing to do. But also, it gives you huge new data. <coughs> you have experiences there, which, as I will explain tomorrow, will change the whole way you look at the world, the whole way you look at yourself, the whole understanding of who you think you are. When it comes to religious truth, there's no doubt, there's no argument said anymore between the different religions. You've got an experience of truth which is so personal, so strong, and so unmistakable, you'll know which is the correct religion. You've got direct experience of truth. That's why these things are powerful. And that's why I try and encourage them. There's no reason why you can't get those jhanas. Some of my lay disciples have got those jhanas, so you should go for them. And then they'll just change your whole idea of what Buddhism is. 
the jhanas are the eighth factor, the eightfold path. That's why the Buddha put them there. Every factor of the path is necessary, you can't do without it. And once you get those jhanas, you'll understand why they're important. And from them, you get the great insights. Without them, you just haven't got enough data, enough experience. That's why the Buddha said, Nati jhanaṅga panyasa, panya nati ajayato. <coughs> There's no jhana if you haven't got any wisdom. There's no wisdom without jhana. And he carried on saying, Yam hi jhanaṅg cha panya cha sa ve nibbāna santike. But where you have jhana and wisdom, when they're together, you are in the presence of Nibbāna. You've got all it takes. Now it's just a matter of time for your wisdom and your jhana to come together to see the truth. That's first 372 of the Dhammapada. This is what jhanas are all about. They're powerful, they're fascinating, they give you incredible bliss, powers as well, but the main thing, theme is to give you the data for deep insight, which is a talk coming tomorrow. So, I hope I've described and inspired you all about jhanas. My warning for this evening's talk, even though they seem to be so wonderful, don't try and get them. <laughs> if you try to attain these things, you never will. Let go, make peace, the jhanas come to you. You don't chase the jhanas. Okay? The jhanas come to you when you're still and peaceful. You can't make the jhanas happen. Okay, so there's a talk on jhanas. Are there any questions about what I've said this evening? Sometimes people wonder, why am I a monk? Ajahn Brahm, you got all these degrees, you're a fit young man, why didn't you sort of leave and just go and get married, have fun, make a lot of money? It's because if you have deep meditation, the bliss of those meditations far exceeds anything the world can offer. Which is why that when a person gains those jhanas, they're not interested in the world, you get something far more powerful. They are conducive to complete letting go. Any questions? Yes? <laughs> do the jhanas follow one another automatically? They do. Going back to the simile of the Russian dolls, or the simile of the thousand petal lotus. If you get inside the nimitta, this beautiful <coughs> lotus is already open, there's only a few petals left. And when that nimitta opens up, the first jhana is inside. And the second jhana is inside the first jhana. The third jhana is inside the second. So to go into, say, the fourth jhana, you literally have to go into the first the first gets more still, and you go into the second. The second gets more refined, you go into the third. The third gets more refined, you go into the fourth. If you stay there, you have to come out the same route. After the fourth, you have to go through the third, the second, the first, and then you come out. So you go through each one, because they're just the refinements of each other. <coughs> like a deepening. So this is always the way. Which means that you can't sort of just come out of first jhana and then go into the third jhana. You always have to go first, second, third, fourth, fourth, third, second, first. Sometimes you don't go to the fourth, you only go so far, maybe to the second jhana, and then you come out second one and out again. You don't go that deep. And sometimes that people ask, well, how, what makes you go into the deep jhanas or not so deep jhanas? And once you're in there, you can't decide where you're going to go next. You're too still, immobile, you can't do anything. It's just the, what I call the momentum of letting go. How much you've let go before you go in. And that momentum of letting go 
So the subverbal tendency of the mind is to keep throwing things away and to spill itself. That will determine just how deep you go. It's the tendency for the mind to be still. So that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Correct. How do you come out from the jhanas when you've got no control inside? The first time you get into a jhana, you won't come out at all until just the nature, when the the uh, the uh, faculties of the jhana start to fade away. They're impermanent like anything else. They're only cha. <coughs> According to nature, after a while, they'll fade away, and then you come out again. So at first, when you go in there, there's absolutely no control. Sometimes you may miss appointments. You may miss your lectures, you may miss many, many things. So sometimes it gets quite... Um, well, you can't really say it's inconvenient because you're having a lovely time, you don't care about all the appointments you miss. But <coughs> afterwards, what you do is actually to give some control to those shadows. Inside you can't do anything. But you can use the power of programming mindfulness, what I've said before, which is before you go in, if you think this is going to be a, a time you're going to get into a jhana, you say to yourself, I will only go in for one hour or two hours. And I will come out after two hours. And that is incredible how powerful those uh, programs are. What happens is that after two hours of the jhana, you just come out. You set the parameters beforehand. Because within you can't do anything. And that's usually how monks, nuns, those who are skilled in jhanas, they usually... Um, adjust the time according to their commitments and duties. So you're just saying, I'm going to go in for one day or one for six hours or one hour or whatever. It's incredible just how accurate that is. The mind just follows. Don't know how it knows at the time, but it does. Yes. Is there any explanation, scientific explanation for the jhana? <laughs> it's one, very rarely do you actually get mugs willing to actually to put themselves under experimental conditions. <coughs> A lot of times because, as I said earlier, we're supposed to keep all of our attainments and stuff all quiet so no one knows. One of the other reasons for that, because the Buddha didn't want to have elite monks. We're all supposed to be the same. No matter who you are, you always wear the same robe. You don't wear like a lame robe if you're like an enlightened monk, you know, with all sorts of stars on it. You don't wear sort of stripes on the side if you're like a sergeant monk or a captain or a general monk. So all the monks look the same. The Buddha wanted them to be the same. So we don't have elitism. Oh, he's an arahat. Oh, he's got the first jhana. Oh, he's got second jhana. We're trying to keep all of that quiet and not let people know. So first of all, sorry. <laughs> so what's the question? I just could you repeat the question once more? I just could you repeat your question once more? Oh, scientific. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's very few monks have actually gone under any investigation, but every now and again, just like that um, disciple of mine because of his wife not understanding, got to, he was taken to hospital. It did also happen to my teacher, Ajahn Chah, while he was in coma. Because his <coughs> history, for the last nine years of his life, he was in a coma. Uh, and caused apparently because of there was uh, excess fluid in the brain which caused brain damage. So his brain was totally damaged and shot, couldn't speak for the last nine years. He was in a wheelchair, just being looked after by the monks. And what actually happened here was a fascinating little piece of information. First of all, that when he had um, the stroke which uh, caused the coma, the monks met together, all his disciples, and said, look, <coughs> it's a waste of time trying to keep Ajahn Chah alive. Let's let him die. He's done his job. 
No, he's taught, he's done everything, he can now die. So they, the monks actually decided just to not give him any medication. And when the king of Thailand heard that, he said, no you can't, I want Ajahn Chah to stay alive. And so when, on the king's instruction, you can't argue with the king, you're not in Thailand anyway. On the king's instructions, the monks had to look after him. So the king paid for a male nurse on roster, eight hour shifts for nine years. There's always a male nurse from the local hospital on shift in the uh, a little um, hospital hut which was built for Ajahn Chah. And <coughs> it would also be two or three monks as well doing the duties. So there'd be like a roster, you know, two or three monks plus the professional male nurse at all hours. And one of my friends was on duty one night when Ajahn Shah stopped breathing. And of course the nurse got very um, concerned and frightened because the nurse has only been trained in medicine thought Ajahn Shah has stopped breathing, he's about to die. Now everybody knew that Ajahn Shah would die one day but the nurse didn't want Ajahn Shah to die on his shift. <laughs> so he wanted to try and revive Ajahn Shah. And the monk said, no, leave him alone, he does this all the time, he's just going into jhanas. Because in the deep jhana, in the fourth jhana, according to the text, you don't breathe. The breathing stops. And so there's this big argument. You know, while Ajahn Chah wasn't breathing, the nurse said, look, we've got to get him breathing again. Because if you don't breathe, there's no oxygen going into your lungs, so the blood are depletes of oxygen, and therefore your brain starts to, to die, you get brain damage if you can't, don't breathe for I don't know how many minutes. So they came to this amazing compromise. They allowed this nurse to take blood samples every few minutes to test how well oxygenated the blood was. And what they actually found with Ajahn Chah not breathing for several hours, the oxygen level in the blood remained the same, fully oxygenated, even though he wasn't breathing. And they realized that that's how in those deep jhanas, you don't need to breathe. Because <coughs> the body and the mind is so still, the brain is not working. It's almost like hibernating. So you don't need any oxygen. So that's why you don't need to breathe. So all the body is doing is saying, look, there's enough oxygen in the blood. It's not being used, it's still there. Therefore, no need to put any more in. That's why the, you stop, um, <coughs> you stop breathing. And the reason why the heart stops pumping because you don't need that blood going around. Everything is well fed, so everything stops. So even the blood stops as well pumping, the heart stops beating because it doesn't need it. Everything is so still, there's no energy being used. Therefore it can all stop. So actually that's one of the only two times I've known, I was another time, when there's one another disciple in Perth. Uh, the reason he managed to get into deep meditation is because he had this incredible back pain. He had so some congenital um, stuff going on with his back and he had to go to the palliative care unit in one of the Perth hospitals. And you know, his pain was so bad that according to even the law of the country, any drug he could take, everything was legal because his pain was just so bad. <coughs> but what he did, remember him coming up to me once after one of the meditation classes and said, Brahm, I've finally done it, I've done it. And I thought what he meant, because I knew he was messing around in a hospital, you got the ECG flat. You know, when he's got these, uh, the ECG measures your heartbeat. He said, oh, you managed to get that flat with your meditation. He said, no, that was easy, I did that months ago. I've now got the EEG flat, he said. And that measures his brain waves. So in the hospital, you know, they're measuring his EEG and ECG, and he can just go into deep meditation, get everything flat. And he, and he laughed, and he turned around and said, see all those people in the back row there? They're all the doctors and nurses from my hospital. They want to come and find what the hell's going on. <laughs> and the only reason he could do that was actually because his pain was so bad, that was the only way you could escape from his pain by going into deep meditation. So those are the only times I've known that scientists have got some machines on these guys 
and see what happens and why it happens. So yeah, there's a few times the scientists have managed to uh, find somebody in a jhana and this is what happens. Hasn't been anything formal because there's so few of them and they don't usually uh, exceed to be experimented on. Yes? Can other realms reach down? A great question. <coughs> in the Brahma realm, the Brahma goes in and out of jhanas. It just goes to rest there for a while. But there are other realms, and this is fascinating, that I've mentioned when you die, you go to that light. That's a um, classic experience for everybody who dies. Leaving your body, floating towards the light. If you've lived a very good life and you practice these jhanas, when you go to that light, you can actually turn that nimitta and go into a jhana, at the death. What that will be is you go and be reborn in the jhana realm. So the same experience you have sitting here and getting into a jhana, you get with your body disappeared and gone. Which means you'll stay in that realm for eons, not just hundreds and thousands of years, but eons of existence. Many universes come and go and you're just blissed out having a wonderful time. This is actually how many beings actually transcend the end of universes. These are mind realms, fully made of the mind. And any cataclysms on earth or whatever just don't affect you. Your body's already gone. This is pure mind. <coughs> there are beings in those realms. Obviously that when the whole thing just fades away and you get reborn again, you don't go to get you can't get reborn in some sort of hell realm. You just come from this incredibly powerful, pure state of mind. But where you get reborn, you'll obviously have great, <coughs> great ability in jhanas, pure hearted person, so the lower pleasures just won't be it won't interest you at all. You're almost certainly to get some sort of a, um enlightenment experience when you come out of those realms because they're just too powerful so it's a great way it's one of the real high heavens absolute stillness and bliss unchanging for eons do you fancy that when you're born when you die <laughs> so that's what happens if you know what that limit is when you go into that uh, stayed after death and you go towards the light so you can just absorb into it same exactly what you do just before you go into jhanas with the nimitta do the same with that nimitta which you see after death you have a great time <laughs> sorry was any another question yeah mm-hmm You can't actually say that because if you ever doubt what the monks say, you hear one monk saying one thing, another monk saying another thing, this nun say one thing, go back to the text, the sutras, so you can look for yourself. And nowadays you don't have to know Pali actually to be able to read the sutras. Many of them have been translated, they've got very good translations into English. And you see again and again and again, jhana, jhana, jhana. You see, that's what the Buddha did. You see, just the Sama Samadhi, the Eightfold Path. The Sama Samadhi, the Eightfold Path, the Buddha defined it, explained what it was. It's the four jhanas. You've got things like the uh, Maha Gopa, uh, what is it, Gopala Sutta, where the Buddha said, the only meditation I praise the only meditation I praise is first jhana, second jhana, third jhana and fourth jhana. You have things like the Mahamalunkya Puta Sutta saying there's no way you can get to Anagami 
or arahat without the jhanas. You just can't do it, the Buddha said. No more than you can get to the heartwood of a tree without going through the bark and sapwood. You have in the Anguttara Nikaya, where the Buddha said that, that without perfecting samasamadhi, without perfecting the four jhanas, you can't perfect wisdom. It can't be done, said the Buddha. There's so many teachings in there that well, if you look at it for yourself, it becomes quite obvious what's right and what's wrong. So if you have any doubts, don't believe the teachers, don't believe the monks, no matter how senior they are, go and find out for yourself what the Buddha said. And then all the books are there, go and find out. So that has to be the final authority, what the Buddha said. But it's all there. So yes? In deep jhana states does mindfulness disappear? Not at all. But mindfulness reaches its purity. The maximum level of mindfulness, the purity of mindfulness is experienced in the fourth jhana. That's what the Buddha said. Sati Parisuddhi, the purity, the peak of mindfulness. The point is that mindfulness is like the passive awareness. I mentioned that in one of the first talks that if you're doing something, you're actually not really being mindful. If you're taking notes, you're not listening. You know what it was like? I remember going to lectures when I was at university. If I looked at the lecture and I started taking notes, I wasn't listening to the lecture anymore. It was just very difficult. Should I take notes or should I listen? So these days, most lecturers, they print the notes out first of all, or actually afterwards. And I know these days, actually, they sell the lecture notes. <laughs> they do it at universities in Australia because I see them do that. And it's worth it because you get the lecture notes, so you don't have to actually to write them down. You can actually concentrate on what the lecturer is saying. So to be fully mindful, you can't be taking notes. You can't be doing anything except being passively fully aware. So real mindfulness comes from stillness of mind. You're just fully alert, but you're not moving. This full stillness is in the fourth jhana. And that's when you're fully alert. Mindfulness is focused, still. Sometimes I've called that, just to give it a, a, a worldly meaning, total listening. I don't know if you're married, but have you ever totally listened to your partner? That means putting all aside all the history, all the past and all the future, not having an internal commentary, not trying to second guess what she's saying, but having such stillness and such openness that all the lines of communication are open. <coughs> Same with the woman. She should learn how to totally listen to her husband. That's a hard thing to do. In relationships, too often people say there's no communication. He's not listening. She doesn't understand me. And the reason is because we don't know how to listen. Which means full mindfulness, full openness. Nothing going on inside. No, here she goes again. Doesn't she know I'm tired? And she says the same old thing every time. Da 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 da. If you think like that, you're not listening. You have to be fully silent. And then it goes in. That's the same when I said about mindfulness when you go into lectures at university or school. If you're totally silent, everything goes in. And it remembers. You can remember it at the examination. And I call it total listening. Still mindfulness. It's powerful. It works very well. Yeah. You, oh, the mind is aware. Not all your senses, the five senses. There's a sixth sense which is left. The mind. <coughs> I'll come on to this tomorrow and I'll talk about insight. Because most human beings are just out there in the world with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. A lot of times we start to doubt whether the mind even exists. We think that some scientists say it's just a part of the brain. 
But when all those five senses have stopped, there's something left. Something which has nothing to do with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. And that's the mind. And then you understand what the mind is because you're there with it, you're experiencing it. You know it, so you're aware, but just of mind. No sounds, no smells, no taste, no touches. No sounds, sorry. You're aware of a different area. So aware, fully aware, you get to fully know what the mind is. After you've been into a journey, you've got no doubt about what the mind is. One of the results of that, you've got no doubt about rebirth. Because you know so clear that the mind is something which is not destroyed when the body goes. When the body dies, the five senses go, but the mind continues. So you've got no doubt at all about what happens to you when you die. All this idea you go to heaven, should you be a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Jew, all those doubts completely disappear and vanish. Because you see, not what's in the books, not what somebody says, you don't have to believe, you've got your own experience. You've seen the mind. And you know how different it is from the body and how independent it is. Look, you've got <laughs> those guys that brain dead and cardiac arrest for a few hours. The mind is just going fine. They are technically dead, but the mind is still there. And still goes on, carries on, continues on. If that's not clear to you, you get into a jar and it's obvious. That's why these things are called insights. Tomorrow I'll say that one of the great things that jhanas gives you is the insight into rebirth. And it's a great thing to know. <coughs> now, because there's all these arguments about do you live once or is there such a thing as reincarnation or not? Is there a mind or what is the mind? You don't solve those arguments by believing pastors or by believing monks or believing books or just believing it because you're supposed to be a Buddhist and that's what your mother believed. You've got to find these things out for yourself. To find out the answers, not through belief, but through raw, perfect experience. So you get one of these jhanas and all those questions will be answered. You'll see for yourself. They have this saying in the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha, about the Dhamma, Pacha Tang Wei Ditta Bo Win Yu He, to be seen each wise person for themselves. Not to be believed in, because <coughs> Who can you believe these days? All the people say that I've got the truth. Believe me, jhana is the way. Vipassana is the way. No, Zen is the fast way. Vajrayana is the diamond way. Christianity is the only way. No path unless you believe in Jesus Christ. So no, uh, Moses was the only one. There's just so much argument. So how on earth are you going to settle that? You may sort of come up here and say, Oh, Ajahn Brahmi looks a good monk. Yeah, what he says makes a lot of sense. I believe in him. That's stupid. Just because you may be charismatic or you may be friendly, just because you might like me, that's no need to believe in me. You have to find out for yourself. All the monks can do is actually teach you how to find out. So here I'm teaching you how you can answer these deepest of questions, most important questions, all for yourself. And find out these answers which are so plain, so obvious, you'll never have any doubts again. But actually do find that Buddhism is, is the right path. It's a great relief. You're very lucky you chose the right one. But you're going to find out for yourself. It's so unlikely, isn't it? Because you may have been, re <coughs> may have been born in the, say, in Georgia somewhere. Your parents was, your father was a pastor. Your mother sort of worked in the church on the organ, and you stuck with Christianity, just because your parents. So you know you've got to find out for yourself, and you're lucky you've got a path you can find out for yourself. So off you go, get into the jhanas. Sam bound womb and they say, Ah, thank you, Ajahn Bob, yeah. Now I understand.
Does that make sense? Do I challenge you? <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first, yeah, the yogi first, the visitor next. Letting go. Okay. Imagine that you are in a balloon, like a hot air balloon. Have you seen these hot air balloons? They probably have them in Malaysia as well, over the world, in this nice basket, and you, and you put some hot air or some um, hydrogen in the balloon or helium, and you go up into the, the skies. It's really good fun. <coughs> you go so high, you want to go higher. So the only way of going higher, you've got these bags of sand, ballast, you've got to throw out of the basket. As you throw them out, you go higher. Then you think, what else can I let go of to go higher? So you look at you know, your sandwiches and your thermos of, of uh, chrysanthemum tea or whatever you've got in there. So you throw that out as well. And you go higher and higher. And then you go so high, you've got nothing left in the balloon. And you think, what else can I throw away? And the a long time, you just get that high and you can't go any higher. What else can I throw away? And the insight comes up. Throw away the basket. So you untie the basket and the basket goes hurling to the earth and you're holding on to the ropes. You go really high. <laughs> and then you think, you've gone so high but you're still not to Nibbana yet. What can I throw out now? What can I throw out now? And then the insight comes. I throw me off. <laughs> and then the balloon goes off into the jhanas. <coughs> now in that simile... Now the ballast and your sandwiches and your uh, thermos of chrysanthemum tea, that's all your attachments, your worldly stuff, your desires. When you let go of all of that, you let go of your family, you let go of all your, your cravings. You go so high, but you can't go higher. Throwing away the basket is letting go of your body. So all the five senses disappear. The basket has gone away. And then you're holding on to the ropes, how can I go further? That's when you have to let go of yourself, the idea of a self, the doer. That's the last thing we let go of. You literally let go of the one who wants to let go. You let go of that which does the letting go. The whole thing stops. No more doing. That make sense? The doer, will, choice. Managing control, you throw that off. You find you haven't really disappeared, your consciousness is still there. But it's now a knowing, a passive knowing, without any possibility to react. That's why it's so still. And you just go high into the jhanas. Do you want to do that? <laughs> so that's what, what, it, what it's like. Another question in the back here. Okay, what's the difference between jhanas or meditation and sleeping? And can you um, alleviate the need to sleep by doing meditation? <laughs> Second question first, yeah. If you, <coughs> if you meditate very deeply, you don't need to sleep so much. It's nature. Already there's a couple of people here, they don't want to sleep at night. Sometimes they've gone to the bed, they've laid down and they haven't gone to sleep. Because their mind is just so energised, they don't need to sleep. It's not as if they're going crazy. Later on they want to sleep, but at the moment the mind is just so bright and energised, it doesn't need to sleep. In those deep meditations the mind is so still, it's rested, it doesn't need sleep. So the first question is, it's true, the deeper you meditate, the less you need to sleep. If you get into very deep and powerful meditations, you just don't sleep for a long time. So, what's the difference between sleep and meditation? They both perform the same function, I'm talking about deep meditation, that they rest the brain. <laughs> so the brain, that's the reason why he's sleeping. It's not just resting the body, just resting the brain, giving the brain a bit of time out. So first of all, it does rest the brain, that's what it has in common. But with meditation you are always mindful, 
fully alert. In sleep, you don't know what's going on. This incredible, powerful alertness, which is there all the time in meditation, especially the deep meditation. And lastly, deep meditation is far more fun than going to sleep. So those are the differences in brief. And also you get great insights from meditation. You don't get any insights from sleep. <laughs> any other question? Okay. Uh, one, two questions and then we'll finish off because it's getting late. Yes. Uh, the back first, will you? Yeah? Mindfulness onto lectures. A lecture hall, okay. <laughs> the thing is that when you get to the lecture, you sit down and then you just make your mind very blank and alert. So, like in a lecture, you're supposed to be like soaking up information. So, you can imagine like a sponge soaking up water. If that sponge has already got some moisture in it, it doesn't soak up very much. But if that sponge is absolutely dry, it's got no water in it at all, then it can soak up a lot more. So for your mind to soak up things, it should be very still and dry of thoughts and concepts and ideas. And then it can soak up so much. So that's what we mean by being mindful at a lecture. You let go, you relax, you stop all the mind moving, stop it thinking. Just be alert. You're like a cat. Have you ever seen a cat on your lap? You think it's just being lazy. It's not moving. When a mouse comes by, you can see it's electric. It's absolutely still, but electrically still, just poised. And it knows how to pretend. It looks like it's still, but it's all curled, coiled up, ready. And the mouse comes closer and closer. It pounces! <laughs> And it gets the mouse so quickly. Cats are like that, they can be incredibly mindful. So if you can be like mindful like a cat, you're not moving, you're not doing anything. You're sitting there. And all these little bits of information which the lecturer is doing, like a, a cat, you're pouncing on each one. <coughs> Does that make sense? Is that, is that what you are what you were asking? Is that the question you were asking? Cause that, are you satisfied? Yeah? Thinking and processing. That will come later. At a lecture, you've got to gather the information. Gather, 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 gather. And you can process it afterwards. A lot of time, you know, the processing happens subconsciously. You don't need to think about it. It just all arranges itself naturally. So it's very nice. You can just let the mind do the job. You can just go and enjoy yourself. And all the answers are just right there. You can trust the mind. It's much smarter than you give credit for. So the next question, last question, yes? Correct, yes. When in coma, you can still meditate and enter jhana. And the reason is that many comas, as someone here knows very, very well, sometimes you can't give out the information, you can't transmit any messages, but your receiving apparatus is in full working order. Many people in coma, they can hear, they can feel, they can see, but they can't respond. They can't tell people, yes, I can hear. They can't tell people, yes, I can feel you. They can't tell people, yes, I can see you. That's why it's always the best advice if you've got a loved one who's in coma, speak to them, tell them the latest gossip, the latest news, touch them, let them see you right in front of you. Don't think that they don't know because they can't respond. And they'll be so grateful for you. It's like the two ways, it's like a transmitter and a receiver. Transmitting radio, receiving radio. The receiver is in full working order, they can't transmit, that's all. And that's what, certainly with Ajahn Chah. 
His inside was in full working order. He just couldn't speak back, that's all. Yeah. Well, this is the old ethical problem. It's if you <coughs> put a person on a ventilator and give them all these medications, are you actually um, slowing down the death? Are you hastening life? This is actually a very difficult situation. But they said, no, we will not intervene. We just let the death go, the process go naturally. <coughs> Surely they knew that that was going to be causing the death, but when you look upon these things in a Buddhist idea that life and death is only the body the mind continues on what are you actually killing you're not really killing the mind you can't kill that mind all you're doing is just uh, hastening or delaying going on to a new body or entering Nibbana so let's, let's take it away from the Judeo-Christian Judeo idea of life being sacred it's not life is sacred, it's like truth is sacred, compassion is sacred, virtue is sacred. Not the body, the body is just a vehicle for those things. So sometimes when the vehicle is just really worn out, why do people at all costs try and keep the old body going? There comes a time, it's not, you can't really call it killing because that body is dying naturally, you just leave it alone and allow it to die. It's, it's unworkable, unmanageable anymore. And it's, it's about time people become a bit more courageous, know exactly what's going on, because otherwise just, our current ethics are run on fear. Because we're not clear what's going on, we better keep the body going just in case. Just in case we're making some bad karma because we think we might be killing somebody, because <coughs> we're not being filial to our uh, parents, because somebody might sort of criticise us, so why did you not spend all of the family's money and go into debt to keep your mother alive? When you put it like that, it doesn't make sense. So the compassion and wisdom, to actually know what life is, and to not just identify life with just this one body. Once you understand what life truly is, then many of the ethical questions which of, in the West is all just run by a Christian agenda, mostly the fundamental Christians, not the, the mainstream Christians. It's about time the Buddhists actually got their voice heard about what happens with you know, the uh, people who <coughs> uh, had a stroke, uh, who have um, uh, no quality of life or whatever. Obviously you try your best just in case, but there comes a time. Was that that uh, Shavo case? What was it? How many years? Seven, eight years? Nine years? Yeah, a lot of time. And it was actually crazy trying to keep that body going for so long. But that's something else. It's not nothing to do with Jarvis. <laughs> now we can be here all night. Maybe we can talk about that some other night. So, thank you for listening to the talk on Jarvis. A deep talk. But at each of these talks and this retreat, I'm going on a different subject about meditation. Tomorrow night's talk is about what this actually means for insight. It's a good one to actually to talk directly after jhanas, because even despite what I say, people think, oh, that's just samatha, that's just uh, getting attached to the happiness, it's got nothing to do with insight. So tomorrow I'm going to tell you about how insight happens as a result of these jhanas, where insight comes into the picture. That's coming tomorrow. So let's uh, share our uh, um, merits with the deceased beings. Yidam enyatinang ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo Yidam enyatinang Ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo Idam enyatina 
Okay. 